Our final speaker this morning is Dr. Stephen D. Gaines. Uh, Steve is the uh, Dean of the Bren School for Environmental Science and Management at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, Steve did his PhD at Oregon State University, a postdoc at Stanford University, and then was on the faculty at Brown University for many years before going to UC Santa Barbara. Uh, he is an ecologist by training. He has worked on a number of very important uh, topics in ecology, uh, helping us understand much more about uh, larvae, where they go, where they come from, how to think about ecological patterns in the design of marine reserves, fully protected uh, marine areas, uh, how to think about designing networks of, of marine protected areas, marine reserves, uh, and more recently, uh, collaborating with Chris Costello uh, on the work that Chris just spoke about with respect to fisheries and what potential there is for uh, reforming fisheries to achieve its new triple bottom line. This morning, Steve is going to focus squarely on uh, a related topic, and that is of aquaculture. And how do we think about the burgeoning human population, the need to feed all of those mouths? Uh, what is the role of the ocean in that? So please join me in welcoming Steve uh, to present our final talk this morning. Steve? Thank you very much, Jane. Um, and thank you for organizing such an interesting session this morning. So I, I can imagine that with the title of my talk, The Future of Food, The Rise of the Sea, that you are all thinking that I'm gonna be talking about what are the implications of this <laughs> for food production from the ocean. And of course, this will have big implications in terms of uh, uh, capturing fee food from the sea, but this is not what I wanna talk about. Um, what I want to talk about is actually the composition of the future plate of food in terms of how big it is, the types of species that are on it, and what the implications of that might be for a whole variety of environmental issues, including climate change we've had a lot of discussion on today. And the, the motivation for this is simply generated by the fact that if we look at what has happened over the last 30 years, there's been a fairly dramatic increase, roughly a doubling, of the global demand or global consumption of animal protein on the planet. And this comes, of course, from both land and sea and fresh water. The ocean component has gone up a little bit with the growth in farmed fish as a fraction of the total. Um, and, and, but the real interesting issue is thinking out into the future, going out into the next 30 years, and we expect that this val these values are gonna change pretty dramatically uh, for two reasons. And, and I'll illustrate these with these data maps. So this is a map of the globe that you're all used to where the size of the country is proportional to the size of the country. Um, <laughs> but we can also do data maps where the size of the country is proportional to something else. And so if we look at population size, here's the distribution of people today. If we project out to 2050, here's what it looks like. If we go back and forth a little bit, you can see that most of the growth coming in the next 30 years is happening in Africa. So there's growth, of course, across the planet, but a large number of additional people within Africa. That's part of the problem. Um, actually, a larger uh, factor in terms of growing demand for animal protein in the next 30 years is gonna be coming from growth in wealth. And this is from uh, patterns of that if we look across countries, you can see that there's a very dramatic increase with relatively modest increase in average wealth in the fraction of diet that comes from animal protein. And this is across countries, but we see exactly the same thing happening within countries when we have an increase in wealth. Here are the patterns that have happened in China over the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, you can see over a thousand percent increase in per capita consumption of meat proteins of various kinds associated um, very closely with growth and average wealth. And if we look at where the growth in wealth is going to occur in the next 30 years, so growth in wealth by 2050, uh, the, these are hard projections to make, but they're in two different components. 
the de- much of the developed world, which of course doesn't affect this demand at all because we're already in that plateaued part of the demand curve. Uh, the second part though is in Asia. So we've really got two emerging uh, issues over the coming decades that are associated with a dramatic increase in the demand for animal protein, largely more people in Africa and greater wealth in Asia. So if we come back to this current status, we can put these two together and look at a simple projection of what the demand will be by 2050. And we come up with a value that's, depending on how you do the the accounting on this, it's roughly an 80% additional increase in demand for animal protein from this kind of a simple projection. Now, these simple projections are actually too simple because they don't take into account some very important factors such as supply and prices. And so this is just projecting out on the basis of existing consumption per capita and increasing the number of people and then movement along that wealth curve. But they're ignoring some of the consequences that would, could potentially happen if in fact supply doesn't keep up with this demand and so that this actually may not reflect the kinds of growth in actual consumption, it actually may be driving uh, growth in prices of food in the future. But for my talk, I'm going to assume that this is a reflection of the level of growth in consumption that we might see over coming decades and ask what are the, how are we gonna meet this and what are the costs gonna be? Now, Dave Tillman, who's an NAS member um, and a variety of colleagues a few years ago, did an analysis of exactly this problem, looking forward in the future in terms of what would be the consequences of actually producing that much more animal protein on the planet. And they did a variety of analyses looking at this, but purely from perspective of production of food on land. And I think the basic message that comes out of this paper, it was a really, uh, really thoughtful paper, was that all of the options are terrible. Now, some of the options are catastrophic and other ones are just pretty bad, but they're all pretty bad. And, and they involve an enormous increase in greenhouse gases on the best case scenarios in their projection, something on the order of additional three gigatons of CO2. Um, best case scenario, something on the order of a billion hectares of land being cleared for new for food production. So those are bad scenarios. Um, but what's the potential good news here is this analysis completely ignores the ocean. And so, Dave and a few uh, uh, students and I have been working on uh, a subsequent analysis to start taking into account how does this answer change if we actually take the oceans into account. And so we've done this by pulling together several hundred full life cycle assessments of all forms of food production that we can find. And a life cycle assessment is merely an accounting procedure um, that looks across the full production from the materials you generate to produce something through the production process, through use, and through then the disposal process at the end. And we look at issues such as energy requirements and resources that go into the process and various kinds of emissions and waste that come out. And we pulled this together for food systems, both land and sea, for all different kinds of animal and some plant proteins. And so let me just show you how this works. Um, So here are values then for uh, greenhouse gases, we've got double labels here, of uh, for land-based protein. And this figure here, the two colors here, the average height of the bar is the average amount of greenhouse gases if we look across all of the different life cycle assessments for that form of animal protein. And on land, the biggest difference between different forms of animal protein is what you grow. It's the animal that you're consuming is what's generating most. So we have beef and mutton and goat that produce on average substantially greater greenhouse gases than poultry and pigs. The second colored bar in here is the lowest value for any life cycle assessment for that production of animal protein. So you can use that as a crude estimate of kind of what's possible on the low end for producing that kind of animal protein on the basis of the samples we have from today. Okay, so this is from land. Now let's add in the oceans. And so this is the first time that anybody's actually pulled together across all of these different forms to look at a whole variety of different kinds of impacts. And I wanna start with the wild fisheries, following up on what Chris just told you. 
And here, unlike on land, the issue in terms of differences be, is not due to the species that you're catching, it's how you catch it. That's really the biggest driver of variability in greenhouse gases. And you can see there's a lot of variability between methods of catch. Uh, but if we look at the average across these, one of the things you notice is that on average, it tends to be better than the values you see on land. And more importantly, if you look at the blue parts of the bar, which in some of these cases you probably can't even see because they're so low, if we look at the lowest value in terms of a measure of kind of best practices options today, they are dramatically better than any form of animal meat production on land, typically a factor of 10 in this particular case. Okay, so this sets the possibility that if in fact as Chris just talked about, you can actually increase the production of wild fish from the sea. We have a potential, if that prov provides a greater fraction of this global consumption in the future, to have some environmental benefits. So let's go back to the figure he showed. Here's where we are today. Here are two scenarios that he showed, the business as usual relative to the rights-based management. If you compare what the best case scenario, this is starting today, fix every fishery on the planet using the best option that Chris provided. We can generate about eight million metric tons of flays um, out of this process relative to what we're producing today. All right, so let's go back to this figure and say, how much of this problem would that solve if we could fix all the world's fisheries? And here's what you get. Unfortunately, it's not very much, a few percent. And I don't wanna diminish the importance of fixing fisheries because it, that, it, it, all of those benefits actually come with reduced environmental costs for virtually everything I'm gonna show you in the future, that the greenhouse gases per unit protein, area used, all kinds of things like that actually go down with that. So it's beneficial, and it's also beneficial because that was just compared to today, not to what happens with business as usual. So this food demand problem actually gets worse from the standpoint of environmental impacts if in fact we don't take those kinds of actions in terms of fixing wild fisheries. So I actually went into this thinking that we were gonna get a lot of benefit out of fixing wild fisheries um, because that's what we were working on at the time. Um, but what this, you know, to recover from the fact that wild fisheries can't really solve a huge part of this problem, we started thinking about aquaculture. Now, I had never really worked that much on aquaculture, and I suspect like many of you in the room, most of the things that I had um, been heard and you know, talking about and had people working on were actually the environmental impacts of aquaculture, and they are many. There are issues of land, of you know, conversion of habitat and spread of disease, escape of exotics, uh, entanglement of mammals, uh, a whole variety of other things like this. Um, that have been explored uh, pretty extensively in terms of what these consequences can be, and some of them can be quite large. But I think the important point from the standpoint of this kind of comparison is that we have to put these in the context because all of these kinds of issues, escapes, exotic species, entanglement of wild habitat change, greenhouse gases, are true of all forms of food production. So if we don't look at this in terms of a level playing field analysis, we may get a misleading picture about what the relative impacts of different forms of food production are. So let's come back and look at aquaculture. Now, as in the case of wild caught fisheries, most of the variability across aquaculture, and um, all I'm showing you here is greenhouse gases, is due to differences in forms of production. Right? And there's, there's a lot of variability in forms of production. There's one component that has to do with what you grow, and that is, it, are you growing species that you have to feed versus ones such as shellfish that are feeding on natural productivity? That makes a big difference uh, between those two groups of organisms that's similar to what the patterns are on land. But the same message actually happens here if we look at aquaculture relative to well-caught fisheries that on average, the values uh, for the best practices in terms of production are lower, even though this is relatively early technology compared to our, the you know, centuries of food production we've been doing on land, relative to the opportunities on land, including you know, if we look at best practices in some of these, they're again, as much as an order of magnitude lower than the best practices for all life cycle assessments we can find on land. So let's do a thought experiment. Um, 
let's, let's kind of, I want, I want to th put this in the context with a broader array of environmental impacts. And I, I think the simplest way to do this is, imagine we're going to produce all this projected growth in demand with one species of animal protein. So say cows or chickens or salmon or mussels. And then look at what that would mean. And what we can do by looking at individual species for this entire amount is we bound essentially all the potential options for complex diets that mix these up. So I want to walk through a simple exercise that kind of looks at this. And I'm going to show, we've done this now looking at um, about eight different measures of environmental impact. I'm only going to provide three here to you, but the general story is exactly the same. So let's come back to greenhouse gases. And what we've done is arrayed the, um, the different forms here, and all I'm providing now is the average. So this is not the best practices, and so this actually underestimates the benefits that I'm going to be talking about here. The ones in brown are all things that are produced on land. The blue are fish-fed aquaculture and unfed aquaculture. And the greens here then are uh, vegetable products of various kinds as a standard. So you can kind of look at, well, what would be the consequences if, in fact, you didn't see this growth in consumption of animal protein as a possibility. And so what you see is that, on, in, as you'll see in all of these, with greenhouse gases, you have aquaculture for these are average values, which are, which are lower than the average values for land-based production. Okay? If we did best practices, they would be an order of magnitude lower. So that was greenhouse gases. We can look at other metrics. Here's freshwater use, where now fish aquaculture, unfed aquaculture, and I've also got seaweed aquaculture on the right-hand side are by far the lowest. In fact, um, extremely low for the two on the far, furthest right. So that's freshwater use. Here's area use across uh, different species. Here, the same kind of pattern where, on average, in terms of meat protein, aquaculture is to the right, often as low or lower than agricultural production of proteins. Okay. Now, my guess is, even though all these patterns show the same thing, aquaculture tends to be to the right, which suggests that there's a real benefit from actually increasing that fraction in the future diet. Uh, you probably don't have any clue of what you know, 8 times 10 to the 6 kilometers squared actually means. So let's, let's look at these in something that you can relate to a little bit more for these thought experiments. Um, so area needed. And all I'm going to do here is just give you the worst and best case scenario. So the worst case scenario is goats and sheep, very close to what cows would be in terms of area production. If we're going to produce all that amount of projected food uh, production just by these species, it would take an area roughly 75% of South America in terms of new food production to produce that much more meat protein. That's a lot of land. By contrast, the lowest level value on this comes from shellfish aquaculture growing at current levels of production. You could produce the same total amount of protein in less than the shallow continental shelf of New Zealand, way over an order of magnitude less area. Greenhouse gases. The worst case scenario is doing this with beef. Producing that much additional meat with beef would be equivalent to adding 72% of the total greenhouse gas emissions of China today. Or 132%, if you want to make this closer to home, 132% of US greenhouse gas emissions. That would be added as a result of new food production because of the greenhouse gas emissions <laughs> being so high for things like beef. By contrast, again, shellfish aquaculture is the lowest. It's about, it's a little less than the greenhouse gas emissions of Australia, which is, again, about a factor of 40 lower than what these other two values are. Third impact, fresh water. Worst case scenario, again, is cows. The new amount of fresh water that we need for agricultural production for feed associated with beef production, this would be equ roughly equivalent to the volume of one of the Great Lakes, Lake Huron, in terms of new water for agricultural production. By contrast, in the extreme case, in terms of water production, doing this with shellfish aquaculture, you could do it with a bucket. 
So these are enormous differences. And I think th this simple comparison shows that when we start putting this on level playing field, and this is true for every single one of the environmental metrics we've measured so far, is that the greater the fraction of, of seafood in the diet that comes into meeting that demand, the better from the standpoint of every single one of those environmental metrics. Now, there are still some key issues that are going to constrain how fast that potential can grow. One is that, as I talked about, from the standpoint of aquaculture, we've got fed and unfed. Well, for fed, a component of the diet we feed a lot of fed fish is fish. We grind up fish, usually wild-caught fish, and feed them to fish. As, I, as Chris has already shown, there's a limit on what the upside is in terms of additional production that can be used for feed, so that's a constraint. The good news on this is that the fraction of the diet that's coming from wild fish has been excuse me, going down for a whole variety of different kinds of fed aquaculture. And even better news is the emergence of new types of feed that are not based upon um, fish-based protein at all, bacterial and yeast-based that are uh, uh, proving to have as good of a, uh, of a benefit in terms of production of, of fed fin fishes, but with, with dramatically lower environmental costs. So there's some real potential hope there with emerging technology eliminating that constraint. The second part is, is preferences. That I've done this thought experiment as if we're only eating one thing. So where's the current diet? The current global diet is about a third of the way between pig meat and beef. So somewhere between a third of the way between those two bars in that. And so anything that shifts the fraction of, the, of our diet um, that increases anything to the right of that has a, will have a net positive benefit from the standpoint of scenarios that don't change these preferences. So one of the good things about this is that if we look at those where the growing global demand is, where more people are in Africa and where the growth and wealth is in Asia, both of those are areas where currently today the fraction of their diet from standpoint of animal protein that comes from fish protein is substantially higher than the global average. So that's good news from the standpoint of shifting those global diet preferences given where this increase in demand is likely to come. And then lastly, there, of course, there are a variety of things that could change behavior change, whether it's the fact that these are also associated better with better human health, the fact that if we in actually start pricing in some of these environmental benefits, such as with a carbon tax, you would have literally 50 times the carbon tax for some forms of animal protein as for others. And um, so there are a variety of other kinds of things that doing these kinds of policy analyses about how changing institutions might shift these behaviors that could affect things. So the bottom line on this is that if we look across all forms of food production, the more that the ocean provides a component of that future growth relative to the land, the better we are off in, in terms of environmental benefits as well as human health benefits. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we've got uh, questions. Granger, go ahead. Tell us a little bit about ocean acidification and shellfish. Yes. So the, the irony of this is we should have started this shift to aquaculture a lot sooner so we get some of these climate change benefits. So for some species of shellfish, uh, the challenge of ocean acidification is that um, lowering the pH in the ocean makes it harder to to build a calcium carbonate shell. And so that has negative impacts. It's been shown already. It's already been starting to happen um, for young stage uh, oysters as well as mussels in aquaculture in some particular places. So that's an issue that also potentially puts a climate limit on at least the lo some locations where you're going to be able to potentially uh, increase shellfish aquaculture without other kinds of changes to address those issues. Other questions? Alan? Alan Hastings, uh, UC Davis. Steve, are there limits to uh, the area that would be feasible for shellfish aquaculture if that's the best option you're proposing? Certainly there are limits, but I think if you, know, if you one of the interesting things that's come out of this is start doing some simple back of the envelope calculations about how much of 
the continental shelf area, the shallow area that's relatively easable, easy to work with existing technology it would take to, maver, to make, you know, have a big dent in this. And I mean, just the one thought experiment is, suppose we tr stopped all wild fisheries and asked how much of the continental shelf would we have to put into aquaculture to produce the same mix and a total amount of animal protein? And the answer turns out to be way less than 1%. So if you compare relative environmental costs of those two, uh, you know, I think as in this example in terms of comparing things with land, um, we are not close, I think, to the, the uh, level of the continental shelf that you could use to actually have a significant impact in terms of global production of seafood. Whereas on land, of course, we, are, you know, we have gone way beyond that in terms, that's partly why there really are bad options on land because you're having to put into play new areas for food production that are much less productive than areas that have already been put in play. We'll take uh, one more question, uh, and while the uh, questioner is posing the question, would the other three speakers join us on the stage, and then we'll have a group discussion in the remaining 15 minutes. Thanks. Uh, I'm Bill Bialik from Princeton University. Um, is there a danger that if people in the developed world shift their diets, that we'll start to compete with the developed world? Because I mean, you pointed out that in the areas where the population growth is happening, there's a large preference for fish, whereas here, there isn't. And if we suddenly shifted to be, <laughs> have the same preferences they did, what, what would happen? Yeah, that, I mean, this is, a, this is a really good question in terms of this interplay between uh, growth and demand f that's being projected here and prices. Um, and I've, I took the simple approach here, which is ignoring that whole side of this, right? I mean, I think the bigger issue is gonna be the growth and demand in Asia affecting prices that are relevant to food consumption in Africa, then it's going to be anything close to the growth in demand here. Um, so, but it, it's a very good question, and that, that part of this, this whole story has really not been effectively analyzed in terms of how much of this is really going to create food security problems as opposed to environmental problems. That I, and, and in many ways, I think uh, that's, that could be a big part of that growth in demand, is going to be driving particular food security problems that are either developed world or growth in wealth within the developing, some parts of the developing world of influencing prices in other parts. Thanks. Great, thank you, Steve, very much. Uh, we've heard